<laughs> That's a win. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, the topic of this discussion that I want to provoke is at the view of astronauts as repairmen or settlers. I know that we all talked about eventually settling Mars and whatnot, building space stations and living on a space station and whatnot, or Bigelow's ideas about launching tourist have things. But uh, lots of things break. Uh, a lot of my experience at, in the aerospace industry has been working on safety and risk. And things break. If you look at the space station history and the amount of time spent fixing the space station and building it, it's actually a lot more than the time spent on science or you know other lab-like activities. So uh, as a necessary skill that astronauts must have and learn how to uh, do this is, is to like go to space, use what they have, and maybe repair things, and that would extend the duration they could stay up there. So uh, I just wanted to throw it open and uh, see if you guys had any opinions on that. I'll pass my card. I think yeah, sure. Mike had always had an opinion. I always have an opinion, right? <laughs> I just wanted to leave short with us. No, that's the question, right? Yeah. No, I think it's got to. I think it's got to be kind of a, a blend of the two. I. I I, I see kind of um, two job opportunities being open for astronauts. One, one being those who have the the skills to be repairmen, the people who are in the NBL training. You know what I mean? Uh, training on the ISS to to actually turn wrenches. But there's got to also be people who have that adventurous bone in their body that that uh, are willing to go to Mars or uh, to other planetary bodies that. Uh, um, are, are willing to stay there for a long period of time because we know if you go to Mars, it's got to be three years. So, um, okay. so, so here's the competing thing, right? Like, do you send out a robot army that you have developed and out to Mars and it sets up the base for you and then you just go there for vacation or retirement? <laughs> or, or do you, yeah. Do you, Molly? I, I think I probably speak for the majority of people here when I say that it's imperative that sooner or later we become a multi-planet species because you just don't want all those eggs in, in one basket. Um, the question is what's, what's the time frame that people think is reasonable and people start getting, oh, well, sure, in the future, oh, in my great, 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 great grand, grandkids, but without really comprehending that. In fact, we have the technology to do so immediately. We've actually had the technology to do so for quite a while. It's just sort of been a, a financial and motivation issue to, to do so. So I, I'm actually not sure that you're going to get much argument here <laughs> among this group that we shouldn't be settlers, especially because all, all settlers will be repairmen to a certain extent, but not not all repairmen are necessarily settlers. So you may as well get the settler repairmen because they'll do just as well either way. Okay. Uh, yeah, the risk of echoing or, or channeling Bob Zubrin. Oh, God. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, my last tweet was about Bob Zubrin. <laughs> Kinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? But I think so, right? But how many lift? Wouldn't it be cheaper to buy him a comb? <laughs> um, it's a lot cheaper if you don't have to bring it back. So I think they'll be settlers. Well, so the, the point I wanted to make with this talk is that eventually the goal is to be a settler. But as a motivation for more near-term activities, do you think the role that astronauts would play would be more one of repairmen or astronomy? Yeah, I, yeah I, I've just been thinking about this in terms of building stuff on, on the ISS. And uh, you know, when you think about uh, like the Apollo 13, like the movie and the excitement associated with that, part of that excitement is not just repairmen, but you know, whatever, hacking the mission yes. on Apollo 13 in order to save the astronauts. I mean, it was essentially hacking up a solution. And there's, uh, for people in space, their unique capability is one to think creatively about the, uh, about the environment. And so when you say repairmen, it's like, oh, I'm gonna follow these instructions. But there's a certain element of what you might call hacking in space, right. which is captured in like Don Pettit has a good talk. Right, I, I was um, actually going for, yeah. for that, but maybe it's an unfortunate choice of word. Yeah. But, but, but Don, when I said requirement, Don, Don Pettit is exactly what Don, I'm thinking Don, about. Don, yeah. Don, Don Pettit has a, has a talk, which I don't know, maybe everyone has seen, but it's, it's 
the essence of his talk is I'm going to do a microgravity experiment and I want you to predict what's going to happen. And that it's that you don't have a very good intu microgravity intuition about what's going to happen. And that's the gist of his talk. And so that you have to, uh, it's not I'm going to do an experiment in space that I've thought about on the ground and I've kind of planned everything out. You have to create an environment on, for instance, on the ISS where you can do creative things and you can think creatively about problems and perhaps engaging, uh, you know, in the near term, engaging ISS participants in what would be thinking creatively about what you can do uh, on the ISS and creating an opportunity to allow that, uh, allow that, allow that to happen. I think that's it's not that on the repairment. It, the key element of human nature is to think creatively about problem solving, and right. that in microgravity you have to really be there in order to think creatively mm -hmm. about it. You can, it's hard. Yeah, and that's and uh, when I tell people about the nano lab development in the United States, the reason they develop all these nano labs is not to execute well organized tests and so forth, but to explore the nano environment to see how nature performs in that at that length scale and then derive devices and derive an understanding, likewise in the microgravity environment. With Don Pettit's talk, Don Pettit's talk, you haven't been there enough to really understand how it's going to behave, and so you need to be have permission to uh, to think creatively in, in those in those environments. And I think that's, you know, it's astronauts as hacker, hacker repairmen. It's probably yeah, more appropriate to seven, yeah. seven Yeah, because I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's going to break. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it, it's going to be an essential skill once you start going to two-year, multiple-year missions to Mars and whatnot. You're going to have to use things and design for situations where you can do low-level repair. And, and, uh, and, yeah, yeah. You've been thinking about what are sort of. Well, I'm mean, sure they have. I mean, you spent 100 million dollars on the ISS. I'm sure you thought about all the space, you know, components. But even well, but the, the interesting thing with the ISS is that they began the. the Designed the thing in a bit of orbital replacement units in mind, where mm -hmm. you could re swap out entire boxes because that they thought that was a sensible thing to do. But uh, I actually did some work with Don Pettit on mm -hmm. looking at, at a lower level, like if you could replace certain circuits or you know do mm -hmm. some small hacking. Yeah. And, and in fact, which he in fact did, uh, he, he came up with some really interesting stuff. Like he used a drill and. and took pictures of the cities at night time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen that. Mm -hmm. And th that's yeah. like one of the most popular things from the ISS in, in recent times. But it's like totally improvised. Yeah, Don Pettit, ISS hacker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Did you guys have to share something? Uh, let's see. We were talking about yeah, the idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to get back to your initial comment, yeah. uh, do, do we kind of send robots to do some of uh, of the work ahead of time before we send astronauts ahead? I think we do. I think we um, utilize what kind of autonomous capability we have to create a, a critical mass on whatever planetary body we decide to, to settle on. And uh, that way the astronauts don't have to do that extra work and be exposed to the environment for that long. Yeah, let's say you're like a space agency with a limited amount of money to spend on different uh, would, would you divert your research, would put your resources into making highly skilled robots, or training astronauts, or flying astronauts? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a How blend. Do you I, I do yeah, I think it's a kind of a blend of both. I mean, um, it's I don't think it's just a question of uh, finances. I think it's also a question of safety, and that's what's happening on the International Space Station right now. We're looking at ways to use robots to do a lot of the repairs that astronauts do right now. Or when, you know, why would we put an astronaut in danger if we don't need to? But, well, but, but why would you pay for a robot? I, and by pay for a robot, I mean, pay, you know, get the funding that will fund not yeah. only the, sorry, as far as getting a robot, to a humanoid robot to do a human's job, I think that's a mistake because it is inherently more expensive to put, to, to get every all the resources together to pay for all that coding, all that R&D, all that production, everything, when, when you look at how much it costs to develop a robot just to do a specific thing, when all you needed to do was send a human to do it. Yeah, I that, can tell I you think why. And <laughs> I, I understand, actually, I'm in favor, generally speaking, of using humanoid robots when what you really need is a human, but for whatever reason, you can't send a human. Radiation is a really good example. 
Like, if you if you need a human but can't use a human, then you should use a humanoid robot. If you need a human and can use a human, why wouldn't you use a human? Sure. Yeah, just kind of the, I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, but there's there's a few reasons why NASA was looking at using um, a humanoid robot to do some of these repairs. One being that if there was um, an event that could cause immediate catastrophic failure, they needed to have the ability to quickly do these repairs if it needs to be on the outside of the station. If you want a human uh, like action to be done quickly, you don't want a humanoid you robot. You don't, yeah, yeah, but why does it have to be a humanoid robot? It should just be oh, a like robot. It, robot. It, 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 robot is what I mean. Okay. It doesn't necessarily That's need to be a humanoid robot. It's just to have that capability to do it quickly, whether it's a humanoid robot Agreed. or not. Um, but the other, looking from the safety standpoint, it may be more expensive in the near term to, to develop these kinds of rockets, but the problem is NASA's budget is so intertwined into what Congress sees as um, kind of the safety element in human spaceflight. And if, uh, if we don't have to risk the astronauts' lives, uh, they don't want to do it because if we were to have a, a fatality on orbit, it could be catastrophic to the to the uh, funding profile for NASA. So that's just just kind of the other. In a, in a sense, do you think? What do you think about this? Like the improvisation and uh, you know hacking things actually makes it slightly more exciting. I agree. That, that, that you're, it brings you a narrative. Yeah. That brings. The hacking and the improv brings you a narrative, and the narrative is what brings the funding. So yeah. I don't see a problem. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Did, I, Actually, I think our time is up. Time? I, I think so. Let's keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> Don't kick us out. Yeah. <laughs> she'll, she'll come in. They'll, they'll yeah, let you know. It's not an issue. Oh, we have five more minutes. Here. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Okay. So, uh, when we talk about yeah, the, so the whole robotic issue, um, one of the other things about it. Why do I say this as if we don't already know? When we send people, it's fascinating to us because it's people. And when they're there for the first time, there's all this risk, and everyone's on the edge of their seat, or they can drop dead, or something horrible going to happen. A lot of people tune in just to see that. So when we are sending robots, as we are with Curiosity, um, and as we have before, it's really important that we um, create a persona for them mm -hmm. so that they can have a narrative. And we're doing that more. Who, who paid attention to spirit and opportunity until right. spirit started having trouble? Yes. Right. And now with Curiosity, spirit, Curiosity yeah. has so many fans on Facebook and and and, and, and Twitter, Twitter and and sends messages as if, of course, it were a natural person. Hey, are they sexy? Yeah, Check me out. Look at this. Look at that. The other thing. I'm a little nervous about doing this. It's really fun, by the way, talking to a microphone. I feel very powerful. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. I don't think I'm gonna give it back. Anyway, I think it's really important. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's important that we continue to do that because it comes down to everybody in this room is interested because you're interested in anyway. But the rest of the people want a narrative. They want a story. They want they want an interesting story and they want to be engaged. And it's their money. And it's their is money. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a, a kind of unique experience. I was uh, being, a, being an audio engineer, I'm actually terrified of microphones, so bear <laughs> with me. Um, <laughs> I... Yeah, exactly. Um, I was at JPL um, for the tweet up there. That was my first kind of falling down the rabbit hole that ended up with me out at SDS 95 and Dragon Flight Research Center and about you know, four other things, that three of which I can't even still talk about. And um, in, a, in a window, very short window, like six weeks. And we were dry eyed in the lab talking about Spirit's demise and the final goodbyes. Until we were told, please turn around, that there's some people here who've been working on the program for the last seven years and they just you know, went away from it. And the 40 people who were still assigned to Spirit and Opportunity were standing in the back of the room looking very humble. And they were sitting dry on that. So it's the people and the machines. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you put the two together, and that's when you have something unique. Correct, yeah. Important point from Mary Michael's discussion. Uh, uh, how to popularize it's, it's people and machines. Right. And, right. And, and yeah. In, in a sense, I, I think this topic kind of uh, ties in with that. And, and also, Sean, I, I don't know how many of you listened to Sean's talk about making things in space. Uh, 
cube labs and so forth. And I think he's going to do T minus five talk too. Yeah, somebody talked right? me into it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be Just sure listen. to mention this topic though. Okay. Uh, I'll be followed. I'll be followed about it later. <laughs> And, and also, Mike's talk, uh, topic, uh, he, we were talking about uh, destination to send uh, people to. Uh, so I have another question now, and that is, you talked about how you can create a virtual presence. Maybe you send this highly complicated, uh, you know, sophisticated robot to Mars, and it's capable of doing all kinds of uh, it's got spectrometers and cameras and whatnot, and can create a 3D experience or something. And do, do you think like people who are accustomed to like video game, like kids. Kids these days. <laughs> Get off my lawn! What? I would like to comment from younger members. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, would you, what uh, excites you guys about yeah. space? Would you think it would be more appealing to yeah. like, go there oh, physically evil. and pick up the rocks? Or send a robot that's capable of doing that? Human. I think no, that would be well, awesome. Why? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Some, like, space is just like full of, you know, well, not really, well, full of mystery, I guess. and. The mystery is attractive to me because um, it's something that, I don't know, um, it's always interested me, I guess. Like ever since I was little, I was like, I want to go, I want to go in space. That would be, that would be cool. I wouldn't want to send a robot in space and like see pictures of it. I'd want to go up there myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a desolation meant more than an image. Yeah, well, yeah, I was just going to say one, one of the comments that came out of uh, last weekend's uh, New Space Conference was, you know, why why would we send humans into space uh, to explore? You know, because we're human. We want the human experience. I mean, we get get something out of robots, and that's a good precursor. But we want to explore because we're human. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah, my opinion would be yeah, you'd send humans and you'd send a whole bunch of robots and, uh, to assist them. Right. Nice. Combined effort. And, and yeah. when, they, when they break down, you go fix it. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, Steve, I thought Steve Squires gave a great uh, uh, presentation to uh, what was it, the Augustine Committee, where yeah. Jeff uh, Jeff Reeson was yep. part of part of that. And Steve Squires talked about what a geologist would, do, what he had accomplished oh, right. on yeah, the two yeah. Mars missions, yep. and what the uh, 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 Jack Schmidt accomplished during his one Apollo yes. during his one Apollo mission, a very short stay after being on the surface. Of, I mean, for Apollo 17, just a few days or whatever it is on the surface of the moon, versus all those many many months for the Mars missions. And, Jack got more done. Yeah, and that Jack just got a lot. And that's what you know. You apply people mm -hmm. to problems where they are uniquely capable of solving quick decisions of right? solving those problems. They bring a whole different skill set. Right that you'll never have on uh, you know, a robotic vehicle. And it's the balance between robotic capabilities and human capabilities that you know, robots sort of augment human capabilities, but it's really the creativity and analysis part that you're never going to build. And inspiration. Yeah, the and inspiration. Well, the, the, things, the things I struggle, I struggle with in man versus it, it, it makes me shut down, actually. I'm going to put over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not exactly what I struggle with. Um, 3,000 plus live broadcasts, and the most embarrassing things ever said in my mouth in, in my entire life were when an announcer handed me a microphone for 10 seconds. <laughs> um, the, the biggest difficulty is, is you get the robot contingent, and I get it, but we're struggling to convince people to fund launches of equipment that's built and ready to fly. Mm -hmm. How do we convince them to spend a thousand times that much to put human supply, air, consumables, food, and maybe bring them back? You can't. It's just not going to happen now. You can't convince people to spend a thousand times as much. So part of the solution is you've got to bring the cost down. Humans are not going to Mars at current launch costs. Well, I shouldn't say that. They might. But they're not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, why would you want to come back? I mean, I I'm, like, I'm I like Yosemite. <laughs> okay, well, but there are tons of people that are willing to trade Yosemite for yeah, the, people you know, months. exactly more power to them. Yeah. And I, I, there is a, a definitely a large enough contingent of those people that you could get a sizable colony. 
that could would be diverse enough that they could have babies and everything. So, so I agree, it's not for everyone, but that's okay. A lot of people are okay. If, if right now all that technology allows us to do is go one way, fine. I, I am one of those people. I would go one way. Cool. Do we, do we know enough about? I mean, we've had a lot of science. We've had a lot of chemistry on the surface of Mars. Do we know enough about it now to know that we could create dome facilities that we could? work no, with the earth and the soil that we so. can add chemicals so. enough to grow plants and harvest oxygen from rock and, and, and maybe find water sources. Chris McKay says that the Martian surface is the most hostile place to life in the solar system, including the surfaces of Mercury and Venus. Wow. That's coming from Chris McKay. He's credible. Uh, I don't think we know enough. I, I'm, I'm not curious. Why, why did he think it was the UV and the radiation and the hyperoxides and the superoxides? Okay. It's just he's worried about sterilization because he's a planetary scientist. And I got into an argument with him a few years ago because I said, Chris, as somebody who plans to go to Mars on his own dime and come back, <laughs> so I'm going to need a lot of dimes. Uh, what is it that you want me to do? Because you're I'm not you're not going to give me any money for this. You don't have any. And he said. Keep track of your stuff. When you're done with it, open it to Ambien. Mars will take care of everything living aboard. It'll be dead in six weeks. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. So that, that you saw this is good. Go to Mars, pack it chunks of it back as Clorox. <laughs> but, yeah. I don't know. Titan and Venus are pretty inhospitable. I don't know how it's harder than Venus. <laughs> He's the expert. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, so, aha. Uh, yeah, I think we have five more minutes. Uh, are you guys the next? Speaker? No. No. They're, they're tech staff. Okay. Uh, I think we have five more minutes. Uh, let's see. So, well, in, in terms of tying together the, the so here's an interesting idea. Like, if, if you have, what, what would you pack to pack? Uh, like, uh, how would you design? Uh, like, what kind of thing would you take in order to? Pack a let's say a small robotic probe that you are sitting inside your capsule or you're in Mars orbit and then you deploy a little thing that is that a lander. A Leatherman. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. iPad. Yeah. And duct tape. Oh, three D printer. I would prefer three D printer over duct tape. Yeah. Those yeah. things are so yeah. flexible nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Brady has made yeah. rocket engines out of three D with with three D printers. Right. To run them. Yeah. Yeah. Really? You need raise yeah. Yes. They're, no, and they're super really lightweight and they're they're viable. They're really cool. Yeah. What's what's the what medium that they're printing in? Are they printing in? They're printing in titanium. They're just layering, no, laying no, on it's a, a molecule and steel. He's done it's, it's, it's not and steel. It's not great metal, but it's so cheap to do. You don't really care if it's great metal. What are they using for fuel? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. And what's the most of that person here? And like, talk to that I know. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's funny how, how certain conversations come up, and a third of the room gets very quiet. <laughs> 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 well, we're working on our uh, ones. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, uh, who's that person? Paul Reed. Paul Reed. Paul Reed. Yeah. Oh, is Paul here now? No. I, think so. oh, wait, oh, I, didn't, I haven't seen him. I thought I had. Uh, I haven't seen him yet. Yeah. 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 He is so, one of the sponsors, so I, I expect that he would be here. Okay, here, here's something. How many of you personally would like to go fly if you had the opportunity? To fly Mars? Yeah. Heartbeat. Just yeah. fly it all oh, the way. Uh, or, uh, or to, uh, yeah, like Molly said, like, like, go settle on Mars, Mars versus, versus a visit. I just inherited a wife and a stepkid, and really? I fought I mean, long and hard to get to the social place that I'm at, so I'm like, I might be able to pull off a six-month vaca vacation, but if Morris I didn't come back, Mars is not going to place for you. Yeah, Mars <laughs> not going to place for you. No. And it's just, and it's just the nature of like where I'm at in my life. You know, I was single for ten years, and then I'm like, I found the relationship I want. And, 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 for me, sorry. it's just too dangerous. I'm yeah. Terran. I like Earth yeah. too, but I do want to get out and see things. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to come back and be a Portofino <laughs> in a lovely. Or Malta. Or Malta. Enjoy yeah. the earth. But I definitely want to get out of it. Right. I mean, I'd pay, I'd pay the 200K, you know, assuming that I had 200K liquid, and she wouldn't kill me for spending it on that, um, for a Virgin Galactic flight yeah. in a heartbeat. I mean, can you, can you get it back? We'll give you two. 
Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enter the following access code to the scout code available. Well, don't fly Wait, so someone over here raised their hand, too. Oh, no, you I did? Yeah, you. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Well, well, sorry, like, <laughs> I kind of get scared. Okay. Sorry, it'll, uh, yeah. and, and it will pick up without, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it'll pick up for the road. Well, from what Molly said, like, I would think that it would be much more adventurous going out there um, seeing um, if we had the guarantee that we wouldn't die within the first six weeks that we lived there, that we wouldn't really die, right? But say for instance, like we had the assurance that yeah, we would live, we could colonize we could colonize Mars and then have the resources available. I would definitely go out there and settle. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, but only after getting the assurance that okay, this is a safe place to inhabit. That's where mission insurance comes. <laughs> and, then, and, and there's there, there, there are two comments that I'll make on that. One of which is a certain thing in the desert that happens every year has a ticket. And on the ticket, it says very clearly, you may be seriously in, injured or die by attending this event. Is this Burning Man? Or I was trying not to say the word. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and it waiver. continues to be more and more popular in some respects, I think, because of the risk. Wait, has anyone yes. ever been seriously injured or died? Injured. There's been some injured. Yeah, but I oh, deaths also. I don't know my face is put on camera, so I'm not going to speak beyond that. <laughs> but <laughs> in a city of, of 25,000, 30,000 people, there are going to be fatalities under any normal circumstance. Now you have people going in RVs. Everything is packaged. But but let me say. The opposite side of that, or maybe a follow-on to that, is a certain local amusement park. Again, we don't need to use the name. The largest ridership at a ride in the history of the park was the three weeks that it, the first three weeks that it opened, six months after after a fatality. So there well, is they, that. They, they probably yeah. oil the machine really well. After yeah. <laughs> People do thrive on risk. But I, I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So also also add. I mean, even when you're traveling to the new world, if you read uh, Pilgrim's Progress or something like that, there is a, a phase they used to call the seasoning, which I think what it was was that you're coming over to a new continent that had its own uh, viruses and infections and everything, and not everyone survived because of the fact that it was a continent that was completely isolated. I mean, the Native Americans didn't survive European contacts, but Europeans also didn't survive contact with the the Native American, I mean the Native American population because of that of that interchange. And so, you know, as your people are everyone's sort of talking about going off to Mars and, and not surviving. And you can reflect back on the early colonists of both the New World and your sort of in, politically insensitive <laughs> comment for there are plenty of people here already. But uh, but anyway, it was actually a very dangerous prospect because you could get some uh, a bacteria or just viral infection that you just didn't survive. And, Deal with. So are people, I mean, we all drive cars every day, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it rationally, I mean, a car is a very dangerous thing to do, but everybody does it all the time, so we just say, it's no big deal. Even though, you know, probably everybody in this room knows somebody that's died in a car accident. Um, but it's, some of it's, you know, familiarity and just really, like, once some people go and say, yep, we made it, and it's okay, then it becomes less of this huge yeah, fear of the unknown. There's kind of the four minute yeah. mile effect. Right. Yeah, sometimes I feel like it's probably riskier me driving to work to Hawthorne than they actually it's, flying on the It's driving. not. Actually, I ran the numbers once. Oh, Space you did. flight is still one of the most dangerous things you can do. Probably, yeah. yeah unfortunately. If you count the, the Russians, it's. But most, I mean, yeah. most people don't run the numbers, mm -hmm. and they, they perceive it as either much more or much less dangerous than it actually is. As, as a percentage of the number of hours spent in that activity? Um, yeah, that's probably either way you could I believe it was, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't have enough numbers. Because it sure the hell is the number of deaths versus covered. million versus miles traveled. No, it was, I was looking at it in terms of deployment, because I was trying to figure out whether it was more or less dangerous than being deployed in Iraq in either the Navy, the Army, the Marines, or the Air Force. Right. It's more dangerous to drive a car than to be deployed in Iraq. It depends on where you're driving if and you're, where you're well, being deployed. If you're a soldier, it's more dangerous to drive a car around the U.S. than. Um, again, it really depends on whether you're from. Right. You, you really have to break it down. But yeah, yeah. we're free. Uh, <laughs> one, one comment on the roller coasters. Um, I did a little ad hoc study when I found out that Armadillo wanted to do a rocket-powered 
They wanted to sell rocket sled rides to the public. And the first thing I told them was, okay, you're going to be regulated by the Texas Amusement Parks Board. And their safety record, and this is what took me a while to find, is 99.999999%. On average, there's an American killed on a roller coaster, not an employee because they get drunk and stupid, but a civilian every two years. Mm. That is not very often. So it's a perceived risk issue, I think, more than that. Yeah, the yeah. perception of the risk is. Yeah. yeah. Ladies, one more. Did you have any comment there? Okay. Yes. Uh, I think you've taken up half an hour now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I don't think well, this is the end. I mean, you can keep going until six o'clock. Yeah. Do, do we have uh, any more? We have. We have. Don't stuff? we have the pinata at six? So we have. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a yeah. Yeah. center and informal yeah. stuff. Just hung so. enough outside. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Wait. So it's actually a vesta. It's not some kind of. Oh, it's a vesta. It's yeah. a vesta. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, uh, in that case, uh, let, let's wrap up talking about repairing stuff and break stuff. <laughs> 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 nice segue. Oh, <laughs>